Ego is the first thing to get in the way of your calling with God. It's the first thing that rises up and conflicts every blessing that God has for you. Ego will say, I'm too good for that. Ego will say, I don't need to be doing that. Flourishing. And so people who go to Achaia have to have a certain status. They have to be a part of a certain crew. They've got to be with the right group because in Achaia, money is flowing. They've got silver mines. They've got copper mines. They've got gold mines. And this is the place where if you are in with the crew, you're set. But if you're not in with the crew, you're in danger. This was the place that all of the Roman senators said, I want to go and I want to rule there because the money was flowing. But you had to be part of a really tight-knit relationship to be able to survive there. So for a collegiate guy like Apollos to move and say, I need to go to Achaia, God has to be up to something. Now, Achaia is right next to Macedonia, and for all of you guys who've been reading through Acts, you know that the Macedonian call came to Paul when Paul didn't know where he was supposed to go next. So God sends him a vision of a man saying, come over here, we need some help. And so Paul says, that's where I'm going. And in Macedonia, you have this incredible eruption of the power of God, churches are being planted, and it is opposing the regular rule because at this time, money is what talks but as the church is flourishing now those who are coming to faith are saying money is not what's going to drive me to action the power of the spirit is what's going to drive me to action where in the past it would be what's in my pocket that would move me to do something now it's what's in my heart that's moving me to do something and so in Macedonia the church is going like wildfire and things are changing and so Apollos in Ephesus where he's getting his name says I need to go to Achaia I need to go to the place where all those tight-knit groups are so I can preach the gospel. And can you imagine what Priscilla and Aquila are thinking as Apollos is saying, I'm going there. He gets the power of the Holy Spirit and he's no longer concerned about his status. Now he's concerned about the lost. Now he's concerned about what he can do for the kingdom. See, in the, in, in the church, God is trying to get us to stop caring about how we fit in and start caring about discipleship. God is looking for people who will surrender their hearts so he can say, there are lost out there and I want them found. And when we have the power of the Spirit, God gives us the strength to say, I'll go there. It's not going to be what necessarily elevates our ego. It might not be what makes us feel better about ourselves. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't really care about your status anymore. Hey, man, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit because there are too many people in church who care what they look like. Because they're still building their image. They're still building who they are. And that's why Paul had to write to the church and call us and say, listen, you don't need to build who you are. You belong to Christ. And everything that is his belongs to you. Stop building. You'll never outbuild him. And if you've gained him, you've gained everything. And that's a message that the church needs to hear today. You don't need the bank account. You don't need the perfect relationship. You don't need the perfect car, the perfect job, the perfect kids. You need Jesus. And if you are willing to say, he'll be my everything, oh man, here comes the Holy Spirit. And what he'll do is say, you got everything. Now you got to share it. Because it's one thing to have it. It's another thing to share it. And so Apollos is in this spot, and he's moved, right? He's in Ephesus. I'm going to tell everybody about what I found. And what happens is God gives him two people to tell him what he missed. Do you see that? So he goes, let me tell you who I am, what I know. And God says, no, let me tell you what you don't have yet. And I'm telling you, this is just like Jesus, man, because every time we elevate ourselves, he's right there to say, no, let's come back down. Let's come back down. That, 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 that head's a little too big. We're going to let out some air. We're just going to get you right back where you belong. It's for your sake that I'm doing this. Sometimes, sometimes we come into God's house and we're all about what we are. 
We're all about what we've done. We're all about what we accomplished. We're all about how great we are. And God says, oh, man, we just got to put that in check. Hang on. There he goes. All right. We're, we're back where we need to be. Because pride gets you in trouble. Okay, ego gets you in trouble. When your head's too big, you become a bigger target. But here's the problem. When your head's in the right place, you have a defender, Jesus. Now, let me tell you about Satan. Satan's scared of Jesus. Let me tell you who he's not scared of, you. He's not afraid of you. He's seen you coming from a mile away. And when you make yourself a bigger target, he thinks, I got him. I got him. And the Lord knows that. So he's like, let me just, let me just get you. Let me get you where you need to be. You need to get behind me. You need to get behind me. <laughs> oh, man. I, there, there's times. There's times where we just get beyond where we should be. I'm not a dog person. Don't judge me. I know half of you, you heard that and you were like, Pastor. Not a dog person. But I have had dogs in my life. And I used to, and when I was in, um, when I graduated high school, I used to house sit for people. And so I, I, I would take care of their, their dogs and their pets and things like that. And I remember being at one house where it was just, it was so funny because you had the dad dog, you know, the dog that belonged to dad. And it was like this big old beefy Doberman, man. He was just like, man, he had so much muscle. I wanted to work out. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm looking at this dog like, that's not right. That's not right. But then you had mama's dog and mama's dog was this little tiny fluffy thing that was about, I don't know, a foot off the ground. Not even like, like you would step and it would be over for fluffy. Like it, you know, like little, it would be, it would be dangerous. And you would think that between the two, it would be dad's dog that would be out there like telling everybody what's what. No, actually it was dad's dog that was kind of chill. And so when I would let these dogs out, they would all, man, I don't know what it was, but this neighborhood had all kinds of dogs all around. So what would happen is they, they would go to the fence, right? And when they would go to the fence, they would meet with all the other dogs. Now, most of the dogs that were around were all huge, unlike Fluffy. I'm telling you, you blink, you miss this dog. Anyway, but this dog would go out yapping. This, this dog would go out letting everybody know that she was the stuff. And it always cracked me up because when the big dogs would rush up on the fence line, little Fluffy would get behind daddy's dog. Yapping, barking, acting like it was the biggest thing. But when the big dogs came, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be behind this big old Doberman here. He didn't even have to say much. He wasn't barking. He was just standing. I would be intimidated from this dog. Just standing there. He didn't do much. Fluffy was the one that talked. And I think, man, I'm telling you, so many times in our Christian walk, we act like Fluffy. We, we, we get behind, and we, we, we just barking. You know, we're just talking about this, talking about that. And then the big dogs come, and we're like, oh, what I meant was. And, you know, if the fence wasn't there, I don't think Fluffy would be either. You understand what I'm saying? Like, only so much because Fluffy did not know how to stay behind the right kind of protection. And church, if we didn't have Jesus, I'm telling you, we would not be around. We would not make it. And so sometimes in the church, we just get our big heads and God's got to be like, okay, we're just going to let this get in the right place so that we can be protected. Apollos had the opportunity to keep elevating himself, what he knows his eloquence, his understanding, and for a right cause even, for a right cause. And he's, he's talking about Jesus, but the Lord shows up and he says, okay, one thing that you're missing, and then Apollos gets it. And the minute that he gets it, his whole focus changes. And Oh, God, let us have this kind of focus change. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to get us off of ourselves and on to the work of the Lord. Immediately when this happens, Apollos says, I got to get to Achaia. That's hard ground. That's a hard region. Yeah, they've got a lot of folks that need to hear about Jesus. Send me. I'm going. And so the brothers are like, yeah, 
You'd be perfect for that. It's going to be hard, Apollos. It's going to be tough. But, man, I, I can see it. You with the Holy Spirit, man, get after him. That, that would be something. And sure enough, they send him, and he goes. They let the churches know, listen, God got another one. He got another one. Because remember, right before this, their number one opponent that was throwing everybody into prison and was getting them all in trouble converts because Jesus met them on the road. And the church is rejoicing because the church hears your number one opponent just became your number one defendant. And that was Paul. So Paul gets converted and Paul's going around. Can you imagine? They hear it again. Guess what? We got another one. God got Apollos and here he comes. And the church is ready. And so the disciples, they welcome him. Now, I want you to notice, because this is where we pick up today, I want you to notice what happens when Apollos, first of all, makes the shift, goes where God wants him. Look at what he does first. Okay, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. Here is the greatest call. Here is the maturity of a member of Christ's body. Here is what you can look forward to when you start growing to be more like Jesus. He is going to place you in a position where you can serve others. Now, I'm going to be real with you. This is so different than how the world works. Because in the world, you get pomp, you get prestige, and out of that, you get other people to serve you. You get your following, and they take care of you, and it's all about them making sure that you are what you need to be. In the kingdom, it's absolutely different. In the kingdom, God says, okay, I've given you everything you need to be, and now you're coming up through the ranks. You're growing. You're maturing. This is what you get to do now. You get to serve, and I'm telling you, serving requires humility. You will not serve if you are not humble. You will not get on the line and fight for the kingdom if you do not have humility. Because the minute that God shows up and he says, I have a plan for you, I have a purpose for you, I have set aside something mighty, something great, something wonderful, you'll say, great, man, I'm excited. This is wonderful. What is it? You get to serve. Oh, no, Jesus, you got the wrong guy. Man, you, you can get a hundred other people to do that job. And Jesus says, yeah, but I got you. No, 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 no. Look, Jesus, I got skills, man. I, I, I got understanding. I've got know-how. I mean, I can be better used over here. And Jesus says, no, no, you, you, you're growing, you're maturing. I want you to serve. Ego is the first thing to get in the way of your calling with God. It's the first thing that rises up and conflicts every blessing that God has for you. Ego will say, I'm too good for that. Ego will say, I don't need to be doing that. Ego says, someone else can do that because I don't want to. And pride will then just flood your heart and give you all the justification on why you don't need to serve. You work too hard for that. You know too much. You're, you're, you're too strong for that. You're too good for that. But when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, you don't need ego anymore. See, ego is all about building self up. When the Holy Spirit comes, you are built up. This is actually why in the New Testament, when Jude is writing, he says, you got to pray in the Spirit. Because when you pray in the Spirit, it builds up your faith. Because the Spirit is about building you. The Spirit is about rising you. The Spirit is about letting you know who you actually are in the kingdom of God. It gives you an identity that, watch this, the world can't take away. You know, the biggest problem with social media and the biggest problem with worldly acceptance is just as quick as you are given the status, it can be yanked out from under your feet. That's why, especially with, with, with students today, that's why they are in such an emotional battle because through all of the different sources that they're trying to find their place in, they can get ascribed to be great one moment and then it can all be yanked from them the next. And they're trying to figure out how that all works emotionally. It's not fair, it's how the world works. And so they're learning to strive for man's opinion when it has no lasting power.